Okay, uh, good morning. I apologize for the slight delay here. <laughs> uh, welcome to the expert panel. Uh, so today we're gonna answer uh, any questions you might have. Um, we have uh, Roger Germanson, John Fultz, and Tom Wickham Jones, who between the three of them have probably over half a century of experience you know, with our product. So um, they should be, answer, be able to answer a lot of your questions. Um, Roger is going to do a 10 minute, uh, just sort of introductory talk. Just a little overview, and while he's doing that, please, um, you know, think about any questions you might have. Um, I will be walking around and just, you know, raise your hand if you have a question. I'll uh, give you the microphone, and then you can uh, ask the question. Uh, my name is Arne Busing. Um, I can answer questions about, you know, like quality of the product. I can answer questions about support as well. Uh, John will be able to answer questions about user interfaces, of course. Uh, Tom about kernel technology and Roger will, you know, uh, algorithms R&D uh, questions about that. Um, and of course, Tom can do the, the cloud as well. Of course. <laughs> um, all right, so Roger, maybe, maybe you can get started. So, thank you. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, of a reminder, a summary of um, the things that came out in 10, specifically the ones that came out of um, our algorithm R&D effort at Wolfram. And, uh, okay, sorry about that. Can you guys hear me? So this is, um, this is the, um, this is the, you know, we build these marketing pages and we release and you can sort of scroll through examples, scroll through bullets. So I wanted to use sort of a postcard version of each to summarize some of the things that came out of the algorithm side of, um, of, uh, of the house. And so um, that's a little bit brief. Um, and um, this is also quite brief. So here are some of the major areas, geometric computing. So I'm trying to give you the elevator speech summary of it. You know, so um, geometric regions are now first class citizens. For visualization, plot themes, geographics, and a lot more. There's a lot of uh, other enhancements around the corners and, and new visualization functions. Symbolics and numerics, um, you've seen a lot of things like finite elements, formal operations, and, uh, and much more like uh, symbolic differential equations and et cetera. Image and signal processing, the theme there is sort of high level operations for 2D image processing, making the 3D image processing sort of complete or almost as complete as 2D, not quite, but it's, it's very close. Um, advanced color stuff, Graphs and networks. So we did, uh, you know, by now, we can proudly say that the graph and network side of Mathematica is complete. It's by far the most comprehensive and highest performing graph computation system in the world. So that's a very, it reached a very mature and complete state. Probability and statistics, so this time around, we've done a lot of things to promote time series as a data object uh, system-wide, so it works pretty much with everything that you could imagine, and it's a very good handle to, um, to, to deal with these things. And we started out building these because we have uh, temporal processes, in particular time series processes and all kinds of things. So random processes typically generate these data, but in the modern world you get them from everywhere, from <clears throat> devices and so on. And then control systems, for the first time, you can actually do nonlinear control. Um, you can model nonlinear control systems doing um, analysis and design. So this is a sentence each, a little bit elaborated. So if we drill down, something here didn't quite work. God knows why. I think your version is not quite right. <laughs> um, Lots of things for geometry for you to explore on these, these marketing pages, and there are many talks. Not, we don't cover everything with talks in this conference, but most things. And so the big thing is, is regions, properties, and solvers for, uh, for these regions. And, you, know, you have an overview um, and various kinds of drill downs, including finite element base. Finite element sort of straddles geometry in other areas. Uh, yeah, this is certainly not the correct Mathematica. Um, Visualization, plot themes everywhere, and yeah, 
that's a lot of um, plot themes everywhere. Um, and, and this is something that probably you all be, be using something because it's very, very accessible. And uh, we'll, we're adding extensibility to it too. So if you want to write your own plot theme, that, that will be coming out for a book project, for a corporate project, and whatnot. How do I switch over? Command one. Okay. Um, geographics. So geographic is, you know, first of all, the graphics layer, like, like graphics. But increasingly, we'll have some more sophisticated visualization functions that sit on top of that. There's quite a few already, but that's a lot of things more coming. Um, the uh, symbolics, numerics, finite elements. Symbolic differential equations, something that we haven't really done improvements on for a while in Mathematica, yet, but we're starting to push that out again, and so you'll see much more coming there. Now you can do things that no one ever knew that one could do symbolically, like, like the event differential equations and delay differential equations symbolically. Or inactive for showcasing things, for doing formal mathematics. Now operators such as integrate or solve become problem description languages that you can reason about, that you can manipulate formally. You can differentiate um, a Laplace transform and have it make sense, you know, differentiate with respect to things. So this is, this is starting to the higher level, sort of second order mathematics, second order logic in the system. And th this is kind of a start on that. Lots of other improvements. Um, there are lots of things that we probably haven't even talked about in this. Um, there, there are lots of little breakthroughs, you know, so who knew that that, for instance, when you solve a, a system of, uh, of, let's say, polynomial equations, it, it can generate, um, you know, 200,000 solutions for you in, in 100 seconds. And they're pretty innocent looking. It's just the fact that polynomial systems are very rich. But we can now do that. So there's a lot of these barrier busting, you know, breakthroughs for, for, for complexity stuff. What did, um, command tab. Um, and then uh, image and signal processing, as I said, a lot of high-level stuff for, uh, for, for 2D, you know, barcode recognition, various kinds of recognition or detection functions um, and convenience functions. For 3D, just about sort of complete, you know, or not quite on par with 2D, but it's, it's very, very close. Um, and, you know, little things like, uh, like colors. So what's the difference? What's the distance between two colors? You know, according oh. to whom? So the thing is what you use for colors, you use what's called the perceptual color model. So it mimics what you experience as a user, and that's the kind of distance you want to know about colors. We now have the capabilities to represent them like that, and that's called an, an, a lab color model, an LAB color model. And there are several more that are really convenient that allows you to reason about colors and design colors <coughs> and things. So that's probably something you might not have thought about, but it's actually useful in a wide variety of areas. The um, lots of things that, you know, even even very, even though there isn't super much in, in signal processing this time around, peak detection is really, really useful. You actually want that a lot, you know, and, and um, probability and statistics. So this is the, uh, um, the sort of second major round of doing random processes. And as I said, one of the major things was to, to make the temp, uh, time series something that's a very broad object that you use system-wide. In in even though it was born out of random processes, its, it's, it's future life in Mathematica is as a broad container that you use to, to hold all kinds of, t of, uh, of time series, basically, that you want to process. We've done something here, which I think is kind of remarkable, is you know, something that's, uh, that's fully automatic time series um, Processing. There's much richer models and so on. There is, you know, arch and garch and vector time series. But, but there's something else which is really, really convenient, which is to search the space of all possible time series models of all possible orders systematically. So that can mean that it, under the hood, when you call time series model fit, it will search hundreds of models. It's really convenient. That means it's, 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 it's available for more casual use. And other things that you, I'm sure you know of, depending on where you come from, like hidden Markov models and, and, and so on. The whole thing is just much more powerful. 
um, graphs and networks. So, as I said, you know, in the early introduction, it's really, really complete now. And um, the, the picture there is from doing a traveling salesman, which you know is a breakthrough, algorithmic breakthrough that we can do really large problems. So that means that that's something that you can actually afford to use in a variety of contexts. Um, so here, you know, to, to, you know, here's a, here's some of the, the, the bigger other systems that do graphs and networks. Most other things are very niche. And it's Mathematica in the middle, competitor systems in the round. And so even for scope, it's very complete, but there's, there's no comparison for performance either. And there are little things here that probably no one looks at, you know, like I think that this is really cool, the complete, complete understanding of cycle structure of graphs. Okay, well, we, we picked an example that you can explain in the elevator, like really finding the best dog walk derived from a real problem at home. No, but yeah. Okay, so very complete, very powerful um, at this point in time. And then control system. Um, nobody has sort of put together, except sort of for research level codes, <laughs> to be able to fully model nonlinear systems and actually do control design. And so the big secret here is that you can make a transformation that makes this nonlinear system outwardly appear to be linear without doing approximation. And it matters when the nonlinearity is kind of severe. Like, for instance, you want to control a satellite, and you have satellite thrusters. It's a highly nonlinear system, and it pays off to actually have a good controller. You want to go through the, through the extra work in getting this level of performance out of it compared to classical standard linear control theory. We can do it. It's uniquely doable in a system like Mathematica. And um, that's... Uh, so here's the... The one sentence summary, right? Geometric regions, first class citizens, and so on. That's all I had. Thank you very much. It's just to remind you a little bit what's there. All right, thank you, Roger. Uh, so now we just open the floor to questions. And if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, and if you don't have any questions, then I'm going to ask some interesting questions myself. <laughs> um, anybody? There we go. Okay, good, 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 good. So let me walk over here. The second question will be quicker, but the first question I had to walk over. And just give the microphone back to me. Hello, my name is Raul Sananes. Uh, I work uh, in Wolfram. One of the things that Stephen uh, has mentioned uh, a couple of times during the conference is the possibility of having uh, many cores uh, many kernels computing uh, for a limited period of time uh, as needed for specific computations. What would be the best way of doing that through uh, Mathematica? Um, do you mean today, now, or do you mean at some time in the future? Yeah, at some time. Right, right. Well, I think this is part of our... Um, um, th this, this is, this is a, a, a development project that's part of our cloud functionality. So the cloud mechanisms that we have make it, you know, they're designed to sort of spin things up on demand and down on demand. Um, and so we're, you know, this, this is an active area of work that a Roman made a, I can't see if Roman's here, but, this, but Roman's leading the effort to de de develop such, such functionality. So. I think Stephen was referring to the development project rather than the existence of, 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 of this. But in the context of the cloud, I think it, it makes total sense. So, yeah. Should there be a graphical design language for the Wolfram language equivalent to like a UML? <laughs> Who wants to talk about that? Um, <laughs> what? Um, there can be. I mean, we're looking at actually a variety of these graphical um, design language, not for the whole Wolfram language, but sub-languages. Um, so I'm aware of maybe 150 of these diagrammatic languages. And at some point, we want to build that in, you know, on top of the graph functionality we have, for instance, that it behaves like a UML or a SysML or a reliability block diagram editor. Or a, um, you, you can keep going pretty, pretty far here, right? Um, 
I don't know if it needs to be one for the Wolfram language. It's, uh, that hasn't really, I don't know. Um, that, I don't know if that would help particularly. I mean, we can Do you have any opinion about it yourself since you raised it? No, I, I, think for I think for large systems, it makes sense. I mean, most people <coughs> just jump right into a notebook, right? Or jump right into Workbench and, and just start building things, and that's great. But if you're building a large system, there kind of has to be this design layer mm -hmm. between the requirements and the actual code that I think would well, be helpful. Then you're talking about sort of one of these domain languages, like a requirement definition language. Something like that, yes. Yeah. Right. And one, one of the things that uh, I would have some concern about is the, uh, the Wolfram language is a very expressive language where language by which I mean English is concerned. Uh, it's, you know, we're into thousands of functions and we think really hard about naming these functions and, uh, and, and, and trying to be able to, even as somebody who has no idea what, uh, you know, how to write code in our language, to be able to re read through our code and get an idea of what's actually going on uh, and not rely on these uh, you know, purely on, <clears throat> you know, fairly elementary sorts of operations. And I would have some concern when we're talking, uh, you know, 6,000 system symbols and growing, uh, how well that would translate to a visual expression. But, you know, it works very well as a, as a linguistic expression, though. I think, I think that, can, I mean, can, I, I can say other things. No. Sorry, um, but, um, I mean, there's all sorts of things it can mean. It can also mean just something to help you organize your code or get some view of like call graph analysis. And we've built sort of things like this. Actually, Workbench is quite a good tool for you know extracting. And we had some you know mechanism just to see how the different parts of you know your code are interacting. I think that that sort of can, can be quite insightful. Of course, if if I can display. Can I, can I interject something? Sure, yeah. So in no way does that preclude you from using UML as an actual requirement language. That's so right. UML is mostly used as a replacement for PowerPoint, right? There's no actual execution going on in most UML. It's, it's sort of a structured. Um, but there's a partner of ours that work with UML and with all the sort of UML editors or systems out there, like Rhapsody, and I forget, there's like three of them, that makes a lot of it actually computable you know, and they can maintain the certain kinds of things that you worry about. Let's say you build a satellite and each subsystem contribute to the mass, but there's a certain maximum mass that you want to allow for that satellite or a certain maximum energy drain that you can allow the subsystems to do for that satellite and to always sort of check and compute that or even drill into sort of deeper behavioral models. So for instance, system modeler contains very deep behavioral models as opposed to that very abstract mm -hmm. you know, model. And if you can automate making that connection, that's still very, very useful. And then I think that could be for any Wolfram, you know, for, for any sort of code, including Mathematica, Wolfram language code. Right, and I'll just show you while, while we're talking about this, I've, this is something that Abdul, and uh, I don't know if Abdul's here, but and I have been working on, which is some you know, new stuff not, not, not released, but this is, um, a, a flow graph of, of blocks of code. So this is, we're starting out with, uh, you know, a program, you know, some mathematical code like this, and then it's producing sort of looping. Um, these are little sort of blocks. So each block, you know, there's like one entry and one exit, and then you sort of connect these together. And then of course the job is you can then go and rearrange them to sort of minimize jumps or, or, or get a more efficient uh, flow graph. So this is also a view into the, in, into the code, and of course, Mathematic is a very good tool for, you know, we can use graph theoretic functions for sort of rearranging this. And then after some, uh, yeah, we can make some sort of rearrangements of the code um, to, let's see, I haven't quite got this. Well, you know, it, it, this, this is the sort of idea of, um, you know, this, this is also views into the code and they're, they're graphs and things and ma mathematic is good for that. Because you also might want to use it for like refactoring purposes. You know, you, you have your code, but, you know, if you move this function from this module into some central thing, you can break, you know, you get a neater arrangements. I, I think this would be a, 
rich area for math mathematical work that we're not, you know, we're, we're not quite tapping into that yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Richard Mercer. <coughs> Hi, I uh, wonder if I could ask you to clarify your, your strategy for mobile devices. It seems clear to me that did you expect m mobile devices to use uh, Wolfram <coughs> Cloud slash Wolfram Online, and, and that's, that's great, but speaking per for myself personally, I would love to see a native front end on my iPad. Uh, John? Uh, <coughs> John? Um, <laughs> everybody's looking at me. Um, Hey, I would love to see a native front end on my iPad too. I I I actually do. I mean, you know, <laughs> we have an internal project, of course. Um, the um, um, we've been releasing huge amounts of technology this year. We've had so many projects going on, and um, I mean, basically, it's a little bit embarrassing. But basically, what it comes down to is a company of our size. You know, there's only. There's only so much oxygen uh, for uh, for so many projects, and uh, uh, and I wanted to get something out to, well before now, so I wouldn't have to have this conversation with you. <laughs> but uh, but I think we're very close to a first release. And to be clear, what I'm what I'm talking about in terms of you know the the initial wave of technology that we have. Um, uh, it's iOS, not Android. We're prepared to, you know, um, to do some interesting stuff on Android, but we're just, you know, uh, that we'll be having a discussion about Android when I'm sitting here next year. So, <laughs> um, the uh, and it's much more focused on player type technologies, being able to consume content that you created elsewhere. Um, and I think that's, you know, I mean, maybe some of you are very successful at creating content on iPads. Uh, my experience hasn't been very good on that front. Uh, you know, it's a great content consumption platform, but, but not wonderful for content creation. Um, and we have to work within, you know, of course, the hardware limitations. And. One of the things about our company, which is which is a blessing and a curse, is that we have over 25 years of intellectual capital built into Mathematica. Um, that's great when it, when stated that way. Uh, when stated the way of uh, we have a 25-year-old code base, which now you want to make work on a on a platform where things work fundamentally differently. Uh, I mean, this has been one of the big challenges for us. And so we've, uh, some things we've been able to port over, but some things we've really had to build again from scratch. And we're, you know, we've set high expectations. We spent 25 years setting high expectations and, and we're, now, uh, we're now a few years into this development project of matching those expectations from scratch. So it's been a challenge. Uh, that's my litany of excuses. Uh, I could probably come up with more if you want. <laughs> there, there, there's, I'd like to add one small thing. I mean, we're now talking about like Wolfram creating mobile applications, but of course, with the Wolfram Cloud, it, it's becoming relatively easy to build your own mobile application if, if you're so inclined, like if you're you know, a company or a startup or, or you know, like a university or, or government. Uh, user, and you know you can call the cloud and just you know build an instant API and um, you know call that and get a result back, get a you know piece of text back, get a piece of XML or JSON back, or um, you know get an image back, and that's actually pretty easy to do with with the, the cloud technology. And I think you know if if, if you want to go that way, that that's a great way to to uh, you know use mobile applications as well. You know that that's just in addition to Wolfram. You know, building the mobile applications and sort of building, you know, like a, a desktop type application on an on an iPad. I mean, that that's you know, that's a big that's a big challenge. Um, next question so is from. If, if I can say one more thing, just uh, uh, I mean, you kind of mentioned this in passing, but for those who may not have been paying close attention, the web story on mobile is a pretty good story, and we're very close to uh, to releasing an app which. Uh, 
uh, well, internally we've been calling it the Wolfram Cloud app. I'm not sure exactly how we're going to brand it in the App Store, but uh, uh, but which is um, a much better experience for working with the cloud on the mobile platforms than just going through the native browser. Um, uh, much more, or, you know, much better interface for dealing with touch and that sort of thing. And that is, and that is coming on both iOS and Android. Um, and the iOS version I expect to see pretty soon, Android probably before the end of the year. Okay, the next question is from Chris Reed. Um, what is the outlook for being able to parallelize NDSOL, for example, with a system of coupled ordinary differential equations? Um, so, I mean, some of it is. Some, some, of, it some is. of them, I mean, right now, a lot of them, what happens in NDSOL is parallelized. You know, all the linear algebra, and, you know, these things always come down to linear algebra at the bottom, and linear algebra will, will be parallelized. When, you know, if you've got a multi-core machine, it'll be... It is. It, yeah. it, it is now. has been for years. You know, that's... that's yeah. Um, I sit on a 12-core machine. It'll eat my machine, usually. Right, right. <laughs> Maybe you mean other, th you know, may maybe you mean other things like sort of coarser types of parallelization. You you can, um, I think I think the we don't ha unless you're wanting to run multiple your problem. You can run multiple NDs. What do you mean, Chris? Do you mean do you mean on five hundred thousand processors or do you mean on four? <coughs> you'd be able to solve those more quickly. Yeah, but which scale are we talking about? I mean, so the, the small scale, it works today. There will be more coming. Okay. Okay, very large scale, which you can also do. If you happen to have, <clears throat> let's say, 500 cores, 500,000 cores or something like that, that's a little bit farther away. Oh, okay. But that very problem of how to partition these big problems, it's a nice graph problem. In fact, there's a graph function called graph partition that's designed to do just that, to pr provide, to set up and compute the minimal interfaces of information flow between these clusters or processors. OK, thank you. Uh, next question is from Anderson Godio. Am I pronouncing that right? Yes, uh, after a big effort the, you have made in the last, two, last year about uh, undo, so multiple level undo, which is very important for us. There is another thing that you, you could m make another effort to make easier our work with mathematics. This is a uh, easier to use uh, debug system. My my question is: in the course of the life of a people uh, <laughs> of more than fifty years. It's a, do you think it's possible to implement um, a system in which you could uh, execute Mathematica step by step and passing the mouse over a variable to see it as well? Is it possible? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's your question, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, you know, so we have you know, we have a certain number of debugging, or you know, a certain amount of debugging functionality that's in the Mathematica front end. Also in Workbench, um, I think what's in the Workbench is a little more evolved than what's in the front it's more end. More traditional as well. I yeah, it's more traditional. Yeah, yeah. but uh, uh, but you know, it's certainly the case that we haven't uh, plowed a lot of effort into improving it. We you know continue to maintain and keep it at parity, but we haven't plowed a lot of effort into improving it as you suggest, and uh, um, you know, basically, you know, these sorts of things, that's, that's why we have these conferences. You know, I like to hear from you. Uh, it's, you know, is this something that really should be on our radar? You know, is it something that, uh, that one or two percent of our users care about, or is it something that, uh, uh, that 10 or 20 percent of our users care about? Um, and there was a very, loud uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, communication from you guys about multiple undo that influenced their internal priorities. And uh, we listen to you. 
So just out of curiosity, for maybe a show of hands, like debugging, uh, better debugging functionality. Who who really wants that? Who who's the critic for? Okay. <laughs> well, that's a good show of hands. That's at least fifty percent, I think, of the the room. So that's good to know. Um, next question is from Abraham Gadaya Gadala Gadala. Okay. I noticed uh, that in some of the presentations that I visited, that Mathematica crashed without warning. Shouldn't Mathematica give a warning first before it crashes? <laughs> <laughs> or at least what do you do to stabilize it? I think I can even answer that one, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, leave, I'll give it that. Uh, shouldn't crash. I guess John once again, because I think you're assuming the, uh, the front end crashes or the kernel. Yeah. <laughs> well, a, a warning. So, can we give please give a warning before it crashes? I'm about to crash. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I'm not sure that sort of warning, if it really is impending, would be that useful. But, uh, I, but certainly one of the things which would be useful is to be able to start back up where you left off. Um, and uh, you know, this is a feature that. Uh, uh, has been, I mean, it's been on my radar for a while. I, uh, I think it's been on some of your radars as well. And uh, I know how it's going to be implemented. Uh, but uh, I also have a bunch of other really desirable features that are in, uh, that are in the pipeline as well. Uh, so it's difficult for me to make promises on that front. But, uh, uh, but I think, um, you know, two things. One is we want to, you know, keep the quality high. Uh, so we don't experience crashes in the first place. And, uh, and internally, we're doing some very interesting things on that front in terms of uh, uh, we're uh, modernizing our development process internally um, in, a way that, uh, in a way that I think you know, is, is already showing some significant improvements uh, uh, to uh, you know, just in the last several months. Uh, to quality, and uh, I think that's uh, uh, going to make a big difference going forward, uh, both in our ability to, you know, maintain really high quality versions of, uh, you know, of the software that we ship, and also being able to, uh, uh, when we do discover bugs, because, you know, let's be realistic, there, you know, there's no way that we're ever going to ship bug-free software. You know, the only bug-free software maybe is five lines of code. And frankly, I wouldn't be so sure about that. Um, so the, uh, but, uh, but one important way to respond is that if, uh, you know, if we do make a mistake, being able to get fixes out there quickly. And uh, this is something that we really have a very significant internal uh, engineering effort on. And I, you're going to, uh, you're already seeing just the crest of that, uh, just the beginning of the crest of that, but uh, uh, you're going to see, be seeing some changes in how we deliver software, I think, over the course of the next year or so. Yeah, and, and one small addition is that we, we have the Packlet Manager to update bugs in the field as well. So, you know, if we discover issues after release, you know, in certain areas we can actually, you know, fix things in the field, you know, as we find out about them. Yeah, we're doing that right now, actually. There was, there was an issue that came out uh, that was caused by the uh, mistake in the predictive interface, and it's uh, right yep. at this very moment, I think, we're approving a new version of that code that's going to go out to everyone who's using it, so. Next question is from uh, Meili Sainer. Hi there. Um, so, biological sciences have become largely data driven. And from atomic scale structures to system level integration between proteins to physiological uh, integration between cells, you have data, data, data. And I think Mathematica has left this area largely orphaned. And I would like to hear from you if there are long term plans to have Mathematica become more friendly to the interfaces of biophysics, biochemistry, the more data-driven experiment meets theory and between the two. Now, to admit, of course, there's some functionality in there already. You can visualize basic molecules. You can even look at PDB files representing proteins. But in terms of what is practiced, um, there's, I think, a large gap between where Mathematica is and where a practitioner would like to be. So, um 
there is um, there's nothing in a in sort of major project going right now on that. It's always being brought up as something we should do, but you know, to my knowledge, there's no um, there's no major initiative that's that's sort of underway right now. It's more sort of in the planning stages. So at this time, I think what would be useful is to hear what kinds of things. Yeah, details. Yeah, right. what kinds of things that you're looking for would be really constructive. We fire up new projects pretty quickly, so that this, this can flip around in a matter of weeks. A zero to order request there probably is support for common experimental file formats. Such as? Uh, I mean, PDB is there already, yeah. but for example, um, AFM surface data, it's a Covidian format, just picking one out of many, many, many. I mean, right. structural system biologists deal with completely different things. I mean, every time somebody has to deal with data like this coming in and being parsed yep. and being manipulated, yeah, it makes the sense. first thing that you do is write your own parser, which is several days of wasted time for every practitioner, I think. Right. That, those are, that, yeah. That's good, actually. That's useful. That's true. But th there's, of course, some very obscure file formats that you know, may not be useful for us to support you know, because it's such a small. But of course, if anyone you know, has written something, it's, it's always great to share that, you know, on the various, uh, you know, GitHub or community. I mean, th those are great places, to, you know, if someone has done it. And, and, you so know, to that particular thing, is, I mean, it's kind of useful to bring up, um, is that um, the, the, the import-export thing, for instance, of file formats, it is extensible and it's documented how to extend it and to make that very slick, as just as the ones that we've written, a new one, plug into the same framework and so on. In sharing that, as Arna pointed out, it's important, and we hope to make that a lot easier going forward this year with a, a marketplace or an app store that makes it very easy to share those kinds of things. Because there will always be, a, you know, however fast we go and however, if we got 10 times bigger in terms of development capacity, there would still be a lot of things outside of that that one would like to do and would like to have available. So I think that this marketplace of being able to share share kind of work is, is, is another important thing for you guys to be able to publish and okay. do uh, things too. Next question is from uh, Ron Lupke. Hi. Um, my question is a little different. It's not so much about features. It's more along the lines of the gentleman who asked about the UML. How's that better? OK. So the question is, um, with large collaborative projects, you have to have higher level artifacts than just going into the code. I kind of thought that's what I heard the answer was to his question, was just go into the code and, re and name it very well. How does Wolfram internally do their large collaborative projects? When, what are the higher level architects? What's the methodology you're using for Wolfram itself? I'm assuming that's going to be the best practice for using Mathematica. So, <clears throat> I mean, um, so we, I can speak for algorithm R&D, okay? Um, the high level projects, have the feature in, in Mathematica, we often go into new territory that no one has kind of tried to take as an uh, ambitious view of putting things together ever before, which means that there are a little bit surprises happening, which means that we often need to pivot kind of in the middle of a project. So we work on, you know, we basically maintain a lot of notebooks that work at a pretty high level that outlines the whole the whole workflow, the whole um, collection of functionality and what we aim to sort of achieve. But as I said, as we run into uh, stumbling blocks, there's something that may be impossible to do. You can't really drill through this particular problem. Or there are problems that you're a little bit hesitant about in an early stage, but you're actually able to drill through even though no one has done it before, in which case you get sort of, you know, really compelling functionality. So. We maintain, we iterate a lot, you know, we write, you know, and this is what's good about Mathematica, you can actually iterate a lot. You can do this, you can take advantage of this, you're able to drill through this problem that you weren't even sure was solvable, or you can fall back if there's something else that turns out to be sort of a, not going to be robust enough, not going to be fast enough, or whatever it is. And so th that ability to, to pivot and be flexible about it, um, it's really crucial to us, particularly for new areas. If it's sort of filling out functionality and something we've done before, we know how it's going to go. And um, um, we use our documentation system, our reference pages that you see. We write those pretty damn early. We start writing examples pretty damn early. 
we do, uh, we stress the functionality pretty early because a lot of functionality take, we have lots of functions in Mathematica can never be finished, okay? But they need to be good enough, like take sum or solve or, you know, or anything like that. They're, they're very unbounded. We could work on solve for the rest of our lives only. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but what we want to do is to stress them and, 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 and get them to a good enough, you know, beyond human capability as soon as possible. Um, and we do that just routinely by building the reference pages early and by having more algorithmic generation of stressing of it behind so the scenes. So how do you figure when you go into a new domain of knowledge, what domain, what, what's your input, how do you figure out what you're going to open up next? Instead That's of a really what you already have. That's a really complicated thing. It's driven by you guys a lot. It's driven by internal developments. It's driven by dependencies among projects. If we do this, then this, this whole other things are gonna open up. Um, and, and it's driven by what capabilities and people and resources we have. So that's a really complicated process. But we do, we do look a lot in terms of what you guys care about. We have lots of bugs and suggestions. There's communities now. There are these kinds of gatherings. So you might not think that, but every time I talk to you guys, I, that tweaks sort of, you know, the decision. Um, you know, it's like people really care about this. You know, and multiple undo, as John brought up, it's like, God, you know, we've been talking about it, but it, it was one of these big enough projects that so many other projects needs to move out of the way in order to be able to do multiple undo for a system like ours. But at some point, it comes to a, a crest where it's like, we gotta do it, you know? Come hell or high water, we have to move all these other projects aside, and we got to do it. Okay. Uh, next question is from Alex Hirschbrunner. Hi. I'm with Nokia Networks, and I had a question about the cloud deployments that you have today. And um, I was curious, with your cloud deployments, you know, we, we're going to have bandwidth constraints for many areas of the world for some period to come. And it seems that there are many opportunities where it's less expensive to download the code for certain kinds of things like image processing than to actually send the actual data if you're not interested in a particular, you know, a new image that you're going to send somewhere else and you just want to do some analysis. So I'm curious, do you look at the bandwidth constraints that exist in the network and make decisions on perhaps what uh, functionality you might send down as, uh, you know, uh, JavaScript code or, or whatever beyond just the user interface, and, or do you look at that, do you see yourselves looking at that in the future? I think Tom, that's... Tom Wright, I think. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure, I mean, right, right there's, there's all sorts of different sort of angles to it. Um, we don't sort of dynamically monitor the bandwidth to decide, you know, how rich of an interface to send down or to delay things. Um, we don't do that now. I think just in terms of the user interface, I could imagine us sort of optimizing things to, you know, you know, shipping down a big notebook, we might decide to ship, you know, have different strategies as to what we ship down based upon the bandwidth. I could imagine that being, you know, a key part of optimizing large notebooks. That's, that's the user interface. Now you asked about data. So typically with data you would, so in, in the cloud, the computation at the moment is very much running on the server. So you would, you would upload your data to the server and then, you, and then you work on it. So that's kind of a very much you driven rather than us driven because you decided to upload your data. Now you're quite right that bandwidths vary around the world and quite dramatically. There's, sometimes almost like different internets in, in different parts of the world. Um, there are solutions to these. So one solution is a thing called private cloud is, is a fantastic solution. Many of us who develop the cloud products, we actually run it. You know, I have kind of the equivalent of a private cloud on my laptop and, and it works really well. And if I share that around a little cluster of, of computers, it, it, it gets tremendous performance. So a private cloud is, is a viable solution. I think Related to that, I think we're probably going to have to start thinking about sort of co-locating cloud centers in other regions of the world. And we've started to have discussions with partners 
for for exactly this for for for, for exactly this type of thing. Is that is that answering your question? Yes, I, I was just curious also about, though, uh, downloading image processing functionality rather, for example, because in many cases I won't have a private cloud available. I just have an embedded device that's sitting somewhere in a cornfield. Right. And I, let's say I want to take a picture and I want to do some image processing on it, but I, I, can, I have enough processing locally to do it, so if you downloaded, say, the library like you might have on your iPad that I'd yeah, right. seen before, right. That might right. be more efficient than me actually sending you that based on the conditions. Right. Well, that, that's. I mean, if, if your embed, if your device was a Raspberry Pi, you can do that now. You you don't have to to wait. You can run, you know, you 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 can run, mm -hmm. Mathematica at the you know on your Raspberry Pi at the moment, most with some fairly small, not almost aspirational examples. Um, you can't break out part of like the image processing or or something. I think that's absolutely. But increasingly too, right. um, the, the the compiled generated code. Absolutely. The, the, the right. set of things that go in there right. that can run on its own is will be increasing Ab absolutely. dramatically. Absolutely. And, and the cloud itself is is and driving that because, for example, if we can do the computations in your browser rather than our cloud. Well, you know, we don't pay the electricity bill for your browser, so and that's that's exactly the sort of thing that we're we're looking for. Now, I, I don't know that we're going to be compiling out our finite element, though. Amazing things happen in, in into sort of JavaScript and having that run having that run locally. But we're we, we've got a program of things to do exactly distributed computing, pushing it down to the, the you know the appropriate place in in the. Issue of image processing. There are all sorts of complicated issues with libraries and things that, that that we have to sort of face. And as you know, Roger sort of alludes to, and, and he's he's very good at seeing these connections. You see, image process. I'm 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 saying this as in I I don't know this. I'm, I'm just image processing in Mathematica is not necessarily like image processing anywhere else because it can live in Mathematica and it can use all other features. Now. I, I probably doubt that image processing uses any graph theory, but but it, it might. So, sorry. It does actually. Oh, it does. Fine. Right there we go. <laughs> right. You see, and that's that's the really cool thing about Mathematica is that when you know when you're an image processing, you know we have a big image processing team. When you're a developer there, you're you know you, you know you, you don't have this sort of narrow view of you know I'm doing image processing. It's you're, you've got opportunities to pull in all sorts of other things, and that's 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 what makes it lots of fun to work on. So, you okay. see. So then it's not just purely oh well, I just need to get this library down and work on it. But a lot of these other things. So. A lot of these um, um, sensor networks, distributed sensors and stuff. A lot of them are powerful enough to actually <laughs> run a a a, a Mathematica yeah, runtime. You know, so then it comes down to business models, licensing models, and I think that that's actually all evolving, starting with the Raspberry Pi and the Edison, and hopefully a whole slew after that. So I think that that's that's probably very immediate. You know, talking year, you know, over the course of year or two, the compilation thing. Right. Okay. The next question is from uh, Charles Grissom. It's Grissom, actually. Um, I, I'm sorry to do this, but I'm going to bring back the issue of mobile devices just for a, a couple of comments, if you don't mind. Um, if you subtract the uh, Wolfram employees from this crowd, you've got a pretty senior audience. And uh, I think a lot of people are concerned about, uh, in, in colleges and universities, about trying to get young people into using your software, which is beautiful. And there's two ways to do that. One is here with these things because every, every student walks around like this all day long, okay? And I'm afraid they're gonna get hit by cars when they do and things like that. And the other way is to have them use your software in their academic pursuits. And so you'd say, well, just build cloud applications. The problem with that is your costing model puts the burden on the people who develop those applications now instead of the students who use it. And I'm very concerned about that, and I've talked to half a dozen other people here this week who are similarly concerned. Any comments? Well, uh, to be honest, I'm not the best person to talk about uh, what our costing models are. It's, uh, uh, I'm not really familiar with the details myself, but one thing I can say in, you know, in, in response to your first point is actually 
Um, you know, I mean, the good news is we are very exposed to the younger crowd. And yeah, it did take some rethinking to, <clears throat> to figure out how to do that. But a lot of times when you talk to people who are in their uh, people who are high school age, college age, um, they may not be familiar with Mathematica. That's entirely true. But they're very familiar with Wolfram Alpha. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, right. you know, I interview people all the time who are like, Wolfram, oh, you're the Wolfram Alpha folks. Uh, and our, uh, our app uh, for accessing Wolfram Alpha has done very well. And well, actually, I say our app. We have numerous apps that access Wolfram Alpha. Um, uh, but our principal app has done very well. Even the verticalized apps that we have for, uh, for various courses have done well. And I think it's been, and, and you know, you're seeing kind of a, a bit of a merger of that technology with Mathematica as well. It's going a bit both ways, actually. And so I think. Uh, I think drawing the younger crowd into that is, uh, is something that we're making decent progress on. Uh, but in terms of costume models, it, sorry I, you were expecting a better answer, and uh, I'm just not the best person to give it. Well, I, I have a few things to add about cost. I mean, you know, like students, they're very familiar with, you know, mobile phones, like you said, and, but they're also familiar with, you know, getting subscriptions to, you know, like Pandora or Netflix or any sort of cloud service, and, and they're used to, you know, like if they think it's a valuable service, then, you know, they're willing to pay for it. And, and you know, to some extent, you know, you can think of a computation service the same way. And, um, but of course, you know, students are very money constrained, and so we have to have, you know, free plans or very low cost plans at the same time. So it's definitely something, um, you know, that, that needs to be considered. Right. So, and I, 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 I might add something else along that. So, you know, I, I totally agree. And, and it's amazing that, that I see, because I meet young people, my, my children are at college. They, 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 Wolfram Alpha is unbelievably popular. Maybe what we haven't done, and the cloud might help from here, is to transition people from Alpha to, to Mathematica. I think that's, that's another issue. And in fact, um, like a year or so ago, we introduced a, a, a subscription, you know, a premium version of Wolfram Alpha with subscriptions, and that's actually been surprisingly popular. And it has like some and more surprisingly popular among students. Yeah, exactly. Yes, <laughs> and I, I hadn't predicted that, but I'm a conservative guy. Um, I think what we're missing, and I think you're absolutely right there, and this is something I'm taking home from talking to people, is the ability for people building cloud apps in our cloud to be able to pass on, you know, to conveniently have a subscription-based mechanism for their, you know, for, 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 for users of the things that they're building. Because I think that, as, as Anud says, I think people are willing, you know, if, if the cost is low and it solves real problems, people are willing to, you know, subscribe to services, give it a go, it only, it's only a few dollars uh, a month and then yeah. you know either you subscription or you know app for pay apps i mean right you know, I, the, either way but i think that, so, yeah. we need to make a convenient way for Absolutely. to go through yeah. our technology to build such things Absolutely. i think and that's I, the thing I, I we're think missing. We have a lot of improving yet to do still right. but right uh, i'm told it's 10 o'clock i deeply apologize to everybody who had their hands raised and didn't get their answer uh, their question answered <laughs> um, but you know we're all around and just approach us if you have any any more questions on any of these topics so thank you